So, welcome to my talk two about singular Yamaba flow. Um, this time I'll talk about what singular means to us. So what kind of singular spaces we're considering and um, how roughly how one can show that the Yamaba flow exists for all times for these kinds of spaces. The next talk will then be about the convergence in Lacta. Um, Right. So what do I mean by a singular manifold? So a lot of people have different conceptions about singular manifolds because um, there are quite a lot of things one could consider. This is what we'll consider. And I'll give a definition, which is, um, let's say, um, broad pictures. I'll not give local descriptions, not a sort of type. So what, I'm, what I mean is um, I have a smooth Romanian manifold of dimension n. Uh, but I do not assume it's compact. Um, and I call it admissible if it satisfies six conditions. So bear with me. Some of these are more important than others, and I'll give you an idea what you should be thinking about. So point one is this uh, uh, smooth space is the regular part of a compact metric measure space. Um, so what you can already think of is like um, a manifold with uh, isolated singularities. We're going to allow more than isolated singularities, but you can also think of isolated singularities, like a cone. So a cone with a, uh, an apex, uh, it's not a smooth space. You can't define, or well, you don't usually define as tangent space at the, the cone tip. Um, but of course, you can talk about other things. You can talk about me measures, and you can talk about distances. I mean, any high school student can tell you the distance from the cone tip to any point on the manifold, even though you don't define a Romanian metric at the cone tip. Uh, so that will be the sort of surrounding space and in a dense subspace, uh, we'll have a smooth structure. Um, so I have to assume, um, because I want to integrate the parts, that uh, compactly supported functions are dense in H1. Uh, so this would be true for any compact manifold. This would be true for complete manifolds, but it's not true if you have a co-dimension one boundary. If you have like if you have a boundary, uh, just think, think of like the disk, and this is obviously not true because the disk um, functions here don't necessarily have to vanish at the boundary, but these functions automatically vanish at the boundary. So it's sort of you can read that part two is saying the boundary if there is one is small. So like a uh, high co-dimension things, at least co-dimension two. Um, then we get this to a metric condition, uh, which will restrict the allowable kind of singularities. And that's, we assume a kind of Alfors regularity. So we don't assume that the volume of arbitrary balls have a metric space, so I can talk about balls. Uh, we don't assume that the volume of those as Euclidean, but we assume it's sort of, it, it grows like Euclidean balls. So this will also throw away some examples. Um, on the more analytic side, we demand a Sobolev inequality. So um, if you want to be fancy, it just as this H1 is continuously embedded in L2n over n minus two, uh, if you write that out as an inequality, it says this, this should hold for all functions in H1. Um, we'll actually, this thing will actually follow from the sign of the Yamaba comes, but you don't have to think about that. Uh, I just want to highlight it that this is a tool we have, Sobolev uh, embedding. Um, uh, on the geometric side, we can allow the scalar curvature of the initial metric to be unbounded but we can't allow it to be too bad. So we need the initial scalar curvature to be in LQ for Q at least n half. So if you're doing dimension two, then you need that scalar curvature is in LQ for Q bigger two. Um, we cannot get away from this. This does restrict the amount of the uh, examples you can consider, but we cannot show the, even the existence of the flow if you drop this. 
will be interested, interesting if you can, but we can't. Um, and finally, and you don't have to think about this, but I would just want to mention it for completeness. I'm not going to use it uh, in talk two or three, but we assume a local Poincare inequality. So if you want, uh, this is what it's written out, uh, but it's 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 the the normal Poincare inequality you probably know. Uh, we assume this holds, right? So what what do we have in mind? What are examples of these kind of things? Well. So man conical manifolds, uh, so things with metrics like this, uh, will be examples. Um, more specifically, so maybe we should draw a picture. So something like this, where this direction is the radius, and then you have a cross section with metric H. This is your cross section, and there you have the metric H. Um, some of the manifold n h um, and th this is what i mean by a cone um, you can also iterate that and be more fancy so the word you're looking for is a uh, compact stratified spaces with single strata of coordinate at least two um, equipped with iterated cone edge metrics um, so in this picture what that means is so in this picture, I'm sort of indicating that you take the cone over a smooth manifold. You strictly speaking don't have to do that. You can take the cone over a single manifold, and that single manifold is the cone over something else again. And so iterate down until you get something smooth. Um, this iterated structure, you, you sort of inspired by algebraic geometry, uh, where you can take the zero locus of some polynomial, that probably is going to have singular points, and that singular locus of the singularities might itself have singularities. So you sort of get it, uh, iterated uh, spaces where the singular space of the single space has its own singular space, but keep dropping in dimensions. So you have a finite, finitely many strata. If you're not comfortable with iterate with stratified spaces, then you can just think of something like this, or you can not think of anything at all and just um, use the six conditions. We're not going to need this local description for most, for all, no, any of the talks. And you only need this if you want to read the appendix uh, in, in, in the paper I wrote together with Schilke and Boris Bell. Right. So this is sort of what we have in mind as an example. Then, of course, since these spaces are kind of popular, this is a very popular kind of singularity appears for all before singularities often and other applications um, and stratified spaces have been studied by topologists going back to at least Milner um, and um, so the, the, the very popular setting so a lot of key analysis is done so that you have a sobel of embedding and uh, alforce regularity and all, all those kind of things are needed have been worked out in this set. that's an argument why you might want to work in such a setting. Sometimes it's, it's practical to go with the flow. So what, what we can't do, so well, at least not in this, including in this book, are cusp singularities. So if you do a metric which has a worse kind of singularity than this conical business, so R to the K for some higher power of K, that's not included. That would violate like the L force regularity and you'd have to check that the other things go through, which we haven't done. And I'm, I'm just going to call them unbounded manifolds uh, are not considered. So you can definitely consider the Yamabe problem and the Yamabe flow on non-compact spaces on um, something like this. Uh, that's not what we're doing here. We cannot do that. We have finite volume manifolds um, and we have a compact manifold, compact metric space with some some singularities. Um, so these kinds of, kinds of spaces you can think of as singular spaces that people do um, by adding a boundary at infinity uh, and having a metric which then degenerates at infinity. But those are not considered in this talk. That's not part of our work. OK, so what what's new? What can you do? What can't you do? 
So what you lose when you move to the singular setting, uh, apart from your confidence, uh, is the maximum principle. You don't know that you can. So we're studying a parabolic equation. So you have a Laplace involved. So it's sort of tempting to try to use a maximum principle. Maximum principle essentially is, um, just abuses the fact that at a, at a maximum or at a minimum, you know the sign of the Laplace. The problem is that equation with the Laplace, so the PDE, is only defined on a dense subset. It's only defined on the smooth part of the manifold. And you might be uh, out of luck and the, the maximum or the minimum is hiding in the singularity. So you don't really have the maximum principle. You essentially have a non-compact manifold in that sense. But you cannot choose nice coordinates everywhere. So a standard trick in geometric analysis of compact manifolds is to say, well, I take any point, I choose nice coordinates in that point, so normal coordinates typically. For the Yamaba flow or the conformal things, you choose something called conformal normal coordinates. I'm not going to define those, but it's essentially normal coordinates, just a bit adapted. If you're doing, um, um, or you do a complex version of this, if you do a Kähler geometry, anyway, you do a local analysis, nice coordinates at a point or in a neighborhood of that point. And then by compactness, um, you only need finitely many such special neighborhoods to cover your whole manifold. So you can globalize your global bounds because you only have finitely many bounds. That we cannot do because even though M bar, the singular space, is compact, we don't have special coordinates, nice coordinates for all of it. Um, so if you think back to the cone picture, if you take any point except the cone tip, you can of course just choose uh, coordinates as, as you would, it's diffeomorphic to Rn, but the cone tip is not. The cone tip is special and singular. Um, and if you try to, to just do the standard trick for, for M, for the non-compact piece, the smooth piece, you might need infinitely many of these neighborhoods. You can't really do that kind of trick. So um, the standard local computations, um, you have to be a bit more careful with. Um, finally, and more technically, uh, the positive mass theorem doesn't hold anymore. You'll see an example of what this means. Uh, so you might or might not know what the positive mass theorem says. There's a, let's say, global formulation of it, uh, which roughly says that you can define a certain quantity called the mass, and this vanishes if and only if your manifold is Euclidean, and this is for asymptotically Euclidean manifolds. Um, there's a local version which you sort of prove when proving that uh, that theorem for asymptotically Euclidean manifolds, which essentially has to do with, with studying solutions of um, the constant scalar curvature equation on opens, uh, open sets in Rn. Um, and that's the point which we don't have. So you, you can't, not every point on our singular space looks like an open set in Rn, so you can't really do that local analysis for the positive mass theorem. Uh, you'll see what this means in a second. But what, what do we keep? What can we do? So we can't do this, but what can we do? So I already said I, I wanted my compactly supported functions to be in H1, or to be dense in H1, sorry. So I can integrate by parts because I can approximate an H1 function by a completely supported one, so I don't have any boundary terms, so I can integrate by parts as much as I want. This is going to be a key, key point, and I'll show you explicitly in, in talk three how we use this trick, just as, as a simple example of, part, of parts of a proof. Um, we can, of course, still do Sobolev spaces. Uh, you define Sobolev spaces by integrating, so integrating over M over M or over M bar is sort of the same. So I formulate all my PDEs on M on the smooth part, and I think of them 
as PDEs on M bar in a sort of sub level sense, sort of weak sense. And we can have a sort of local Hanak inequality. Uh, so Hanak inequalities are uh, inequalities you get, uh, the bounds you get on the solution to elliptic PDEs. So since we have a parabolic PDE, we um, can think of that as a family of elliptic PDEs, then you can use Hanak inequalities. And there are local Hanak inequalities which we'll be using. So um, you'll see an example of that in talk three. So this is a, a sort of our toolbox. Um, so what can we do? So, or sorry, first, what, what have people done with that toolbox? So Akurugawa, uh, Caron, and Matseo uh, already tackled the Yamabo problem using the elliptic formulation uh, almost a decade ago. And they came up with the following theorem, namely that if you have a manifold which satisfies the above list. Uh, I think they're mostly thinking about strider fed spaces, but you don't have to. So as long as it satisfies the above list. Um, and you need an additional assumption that something called the local Yamabe constant, I'll define that in a second, is larger than the Yamabe constant of your space. The Yamabe constant was defined in talk one. It's roughly speaking the smallest average scalar curvature. Strictly speaking, it's the infimum of the scalar, average scalar curvature in the conformal class. If this uh, local Yamaha constant is strictly bigger, then the Yamaha problem has a solution. Meaning, you have a positive function such that if you use that positive function to rescale your metric, you get constant scalar curvature. Um, so what does this thing mean? Uh, well, it's slightly technical. So you can define the Yamabe constant, you can define for any manifold. So you can define it for an open subset of your manifold or a closed ball if you want. Um, and you, you compute this Yamabe constant uh, for any ball and you let the radius go to zero. That's gonna give you some number. And then you take the infimum over all points in your manifold. That's your local uh, Yamabe. So what on earth is this thing? It's kind of mysterious. It's, it's a research topic trying to understand what this is in general. Um, in some special cases, you can identify it with a local sobble of constant, which might or might not help you. Um, in the smooth case, uh, one can say exactly what it is because in the smooth case, any point, so any, any ball in a smooth manifold is going to look like Rn. And Rn, conformally speaking, is sort of like a round sphere, this statement. And um, it's, it's a dense subset in a round sphere. And um, if, if every point looks like that, so if you don't have any singular points, then this local Yamabe constant is gonna be the Yamabe constant of a round sphere. Uh, I don't plan to show this, but you can show um, that this for smooth manifolds, smooth compact manifolds, this is the largest Yamabe constant you can have. The sphere sort of has the largest Yamabe constant of all manifolds. Um, and in the smooth case, the smooth compact case, uh, people typically assumed this. So they said, let the Yamabe constant be strictly smaller than one of the sphere, then Yamabe problem has a solution. Then Shane finally showed that there's um, kind of rigidity going on in the smooth case. Namely, if you have a manifold with um, Yamabe constant equal to the one of a round sphere, then your manifold is conformally equivalent to the round sphere. Roughly speaking, only the sphere with round metric has the conformal, has the Yamabe constant of a sphere. So once you dealt with the sphere, uh, which is sort of done, dealt with already, this thing has constant scale curvature, you can, without loss of generality, assume your Yamabe constant is smaller than the one on the sphere. In the singular case, 
that's no longer true. It's not known exactly how rigid this thing is. Um, so let me get uh, get more, more precise. So Vyaklovsky showed uh, actually before Kakutugawa uh, Kromatseo, around that time, so 2010, I think he published. Um, he gave counter who uh, gave examples of spaces, uh, singular spaces which satisfy our definition of singular spaces, uh, which do not admit any constant scalar curvature metrics in the conformal class. So spaces which satisfy our six point list for single spaces, but which do not admit solutions to your marble problem. Um, so these spaces are uh, these spaces, the Yamabe constant equals the local one necessarily, because Kodogama Koromatseo showed that if it doesn't, then you can uh, always solve the Yamabe problem. Um, so, what these spaces are, you'll see a simple example or relatively simple example at the end of talk three. I can tell you already. Uh, so, these are certain non-compact spaces, uh, the one I'll talk about in talk three is the Iguchi Hansen space. It's a sort of, it's a asymptotically locally Euclidean space. Um, so it's non-compact and it says infinite volume, but what you do is you add a point at infinity and then you conformally change the metric so that infinity gets moved down to a finite distance. This is going to introduce a singularity because that conformal rescaling is going to vanish at infinity. So this new point at infinity. So the point at infinity is going to be at a finite distance, but the metric is going to degenerate to that point. But it's uh, it's going to be an orbifold with a single an isolated singularity of the type R four divided by plus minus. So a very simple orbifold singularity. And the metric just degenerates in a very regular fashion, but you still cannot solve the amount. Uh, you'll see in, in talk three, uh, exactly what that is. So what can we show? Uh, I'll spoil that already. So um, we are going to be studying the, ellip the parabolic problem, so the amount of flow. Um, and if you have a manifold which satisfies the above six conditions, um, then the amount of flow exists for all time. Uh, I'll tell you a bit about that in a bit. And under suitable upper bounds and initial energy, you'll learn more about this in talk three, you have convergent subsequences of the flow. Uh, so exactly what um, uh, upper bounds and initial energy means uh, is um, the positive part of the scalar curvature you start with needs to have uh, L n half norm strictly smaller than the local Yamaha constant. Um, so this is similar to the to the energy bound you, you find in the work of Schwedlik and Struve for the smooth case, that they have the your mom becomes a sphere there, and they take, they assume you already have a, a positive scale curvature. Um, so then it's essentially the same condition they impose. Brendel was allowed, uh, was able to get away from this condition because he was able to use the positive mass theorem, which we don't have. So we don't know how to improve on this part. But if you have a bound on initial energy, then you get from the subsequences. But in any way, you get. Um, long time existence. So um, let me talk a bit about the long time. Um, sorry, there's also an alternative, namely uh, that if the flow doesn't converge, then there are finitely many points where the flow accumulates. That's still alternative. So um, for the short time existence, what exactly is the key there? Um, well, we strictly speaking don't need a whole shopping list of six conditions on M, but um, you can just assume them, they're not that bad. Um, then the short term existence result uh, is, says that if you take um, any 
bounded conformal factor bound from below and above. And uh, a scalar curvature in LQ for some Q larger than n half. Um, then there is a finite time such that the amoeba flow exists on this finite time interval, or potentially finite time, um, with solution in um, H2P, so two weak derivatives and function and both weak derivatives are in LP. Um, and of course, the, if, you, if you send T to zero, you, you recover the uh, thing you start with. This solution also has the property, that part of the statement, that the scalar curvature belongs to the same Sobolev space, or well, kind of the same Sobolev space, but not quite. So it's a Sobolev space with uh, measured with a time evolving metric and not with the initial one. Um, so in, in the smooth case, this is sort of usually brushed away in the papers as standard parabolic theory. Uh, in our case, you have to work a bit harder for it. Um, so by working a bit harder, we mean looking at this book, which at least what we did, that's a book about semigroups uh, where she works in quite large broad regularity and quite abstract settings. So she typically doesn't consider open subsets of Rn, but um, operators on Banach spaces. Um, so it's a very good book if you ever need to look up any advanced topics in uh, semigroup theory. Um, and what you would need um, other than that is we assume a sort of sublet inequality, some sublet inequality. Um, and that will give you heat kernel estimates, uh, being slightly technical again. So Schultz said, um, the Yamaba flow is sort of like a heat um, heat equation. So you can use sort of the heat kernel to get something out of the Yamaba flow. Uh, and what, what you get uh, is that if if your function is in this Sobolev space, um, you're going to have some embedding into LNZ. So it, it's sort of, it's what you know from Sobolev space theory. Uh, I guess that if you have enough weak derivatives, then you actually have a higher LP regularity of the function. And in this case, uh, this is our statement. So even though I say uh, you you have a function in the Sobolev space and a scalar coach in the Sobolev space, um, the solution and the, the scalar coach are going to be bounded for finite times. So Included in the statement is that even if you start the scalar curvature, which is singular, so it has to be in LQ for Q big enough, but it can be singular, doesn't have to be bounded, it will be bounded for all positive times or instantly. Um, I don't want to get into the details of proving this. It's a semi group theory, so it's a slightly technical thing, but it's not very long. Um, but let me just say what we do with it. Um, so you use this, um, the, and I got some bounds already in our previous work with Boris Feldman, um, showing that for any finite time, you can bound the solution to the Amado flow and uh, the, the scalar curvature. Um, so with this, you, you know that the flow exists for all time. So let me take a step back there uh, because this, this might be a bit technical. Um, so what you typically do for geometric flows is you have a geometric flow which involves certain quantities. In our case, it involves scalar curvature and the conformal factor U. Um, typically you have statements saying, assuming the, the quantities which are involved, conformal factor and scalar curvature, are suitably bounded, then you're gonna have solutions for finite time. So what you show us as step two is that the quantities don't blow up because if the quantities don't blow up, so in our case, the conformal factor and the scalar curvature, then you can continue the flow. 
So if you had existence for a finite time, and you can show after that finite time that none of the quantities involved have blown up, then you can just restart the flow and they get a larger interval. And as long as you can show that for any finite time, the solution doesn't blow up, you can just keep extending the flow. So that's sort of uh, a myth meta theorem, if you want. It's the sort of thing you have to show for any geometric flow. Um, so these bounds follow more or less directly from the equation um, with some integration by parts. I don't want to show, show you the argument for it here and instead propose postpone it for talk three, where I'll show you exactly how you get these kinds of bounds uh, from cleverly using the equations. Um, here, there's also some um, Moser iteration involved, but uh, it's, it's in the paper if you want to look it up, or in both papers actually, if you want to look it up. Um, right, so that's it for talk two. Talk three will then be convergence and uh, as an explicit proof of, or an explicit example of how one gets these kind of bounds from the Yamada flow equation. And at the end of talk three, you'll also see a counterexample. So one of the Aklovsky's counterexample where we actually did some numerics, we can actually see what happens for the Yamada flow. So see you in talk three then. <laughs>